Welcome back to another video in our API series. Now, in the previous video, we have looked at API documentation, how it fits together and how it works. However, in this video, we're going to bring it to life a little bit because the previous video, as informative as it may have been, was very conceptual, very abstract. So what I'm going to do in this one is just bring it to life, make a few API calls of our own and just show you how that all works. Now, we're going to be going through the Webflow CMS uh, API reference again. Um, starting from the top, just exactly as we did before, except this time we're going to execute it. We're going to actually uh, do the things that we've been talking about. Now, we're going to use this tool called Hopscotch. Hopscotch is essentially just what we call an API client, which is a tool for sending and receiving information via APIs. In practice, when you were, you know, when you were building an app, then you would be essentially using whatever you know API tool is built into your no code uh, platform of choice. So you know, if it's Zapier, then it has its own way of doing APIs. If it's Glide, if it's you know Bubble, whatever tool you're using. However. The reason um, that I've decided not to use one of them for this demo is for two, two kind of, uh, I guess, key things to watch out for, which is number one, if you just want to experiment with an API, see what it can do, play about with it, make sure it makes sense, then it's worth just grabbing an API client like this so that you can mess around with it really, really quickly. You don't have to set up a database, you don't have to sign into your no-code tool, etc. The other reason is typically... Um, when you are building with a no-code tool, you're going to have to set up a workflow, you're going to have to send certain data into the API. There's a lot of kind of setup that's needed just to get an API to work in the no-code tool. Um, it's actually a good thing, but, you know, it's only for when you're building an app. When you're building an app, yeah, absolutely, you're going to set up a database and a workflow before you work with APIs, obviously. Um, but when you're just trying to test about and play with APIs, that doesn't make a whole amount of sense. So... You can find this tool at uh, hopscotch.io, it's hop with two Ps, it's completely free, there's no login, literally the minute you type in that URL you're going to land on exactly the same page that I am on here. Um, and we can see a few things that might be, you know, I, I can appreciate this is probably quite an intimidating design, there's a lot going on here, but let me kind of talk through what we do care about and what we don't care about, because there are a few things you're probably going to immediately appreciate. Um, so we've got the method here. And we've got get, post, put, delete. Yes, there's some stuff you've not seen like connect and head. Don't worry about them. It's just programmer stuff. Even programmers don't really use it. Um, we've got a, a box here for our base URL. And then down here, we've got a couple of things that might sound a little bit familiar. We've got parameters. Um, and if I click that, I can add a key and a value to a parameter. Um, I've got my headers. And again, I can add a key and a value. Uh, and if you remember, headers were something that featured in our, um, our API reference. And then what I also have is authentication. So I can pick various methods of authentication like open off uh, or bearer token. Um, you might remember bearer token again from the API reference on Webflow uh, where we had this authorization token bearer. Any API tool worth its salt will typically split the normal headers out from the authentication header. So the first thing that I'm going to need to do is get my authentication token or my API key. And the way I do that, this will be different again than every no-code tool, but in Webflow, I simply come into my project, which in this case is called no-code demo, um, I go to the integrations tab, I scroll down, and I've got an API key here. Now, I've already generated one. I'm going to generate another one. It will never, ever show me this key again. So if I lose it, I'm going to have to regenerate it, and that is a pain. But the reason for that is because if anybody gets access to this key, they can control your whole website. So you never want to show this to anybody. You never want anyone to see it. Clearly, I'm putting it in a video, but the first thing I'm going to do at the end of this video is I'm going to, as soon as I turn the screen off, I am going to go and reset my token. So even though you're seeing my full token today, it will not work in the future. So I've got my token. I'm going to paste it in here. And this is something you can do. It can be a Webflow API. It can be any API. Um, but whenever a bearer token or an API token is available, you can put it in there. Um, sometimes different tools will have a, a different way of doing it, but you can always just put a header in there. You've got this other stuff like prerequisite script and tests. Don't worry about that. Um, it really doesn't matter unless you are um, programming at this stage, to be honest. So what else do we need? Well, what we're probably going to do in this video is I think we'll go and list out all the sites I've got. Once we've got the sites, we'll list out the uh, collection ID. Uh, collections and their collection IDs. Once we've got the unique IDs, we'll then go in, take a look at each collection and put an item in them. So 
If we have a little bit look at this, uh, this is suggesting that uh, when we go to list sites, we need to have this header here. So we've already got our authorization one. We've already, uh, we need to be issue sure URL, so we'll grab that. I'm just going to copy and paste that. So, oh dear, why can't I drag properly? Control C, if I go into Hopscotch, in my URL field, I'm going to paste that in. So, okay, we've got our base URL, api.webflow.com, and we're going to look up sites. So we've put slash sites. Uh, we've also got another header here, which is called Accept Version. So you could copy and paste this, I'll just type it in. Uh, so I'm going to hit New, again I get this key value. Now it will suggest some stuff, uh, this one's quite non-standard so it doesn't come up as a suggestion, but I'm going to do 1.0.0. So my key is Accept Version, my value is 1.0.0 as you can see here. And it's telling me it's a GET request, it's Webflow, it's Site. So I think we've got everything. We've got our header. We've got our authentication token and we've got our URL and it's set to the right method, which according to our reference here is a get method. And if you remember from the, the API slides, get is the equivalent of read or retrieve, um, similar to the, the CRUD methodology. Now let's hit send and see what happens. So immediately we see this API status that I was talking about in the previous video. 200 green means it is okay, it worked, everything's good. And we can immediately see, look, we've got actual real data live from Webflow's API right now. This is a no-code demo site, which is this here, no-code demo site, the designer. designer. Um, and we've got kind of relevant information, you know, okay, the time zone's Europe, uh, the last time the site was published was yesterday, which is true. That's when I recorded the repeating data list video um, and published a whole kind of blog post look, etc. So we can see all this information and importantly, we can see the ID. So this is a unique identifier for this particular record. I've got loads of uh, no-code sites, but this is set up in such a way that it's only going to show me this one, um, just because I don't want to show off my IDs and stuff from my other websites that are actually real and in use. So if I grab that, what I can now do, if you remember, when we want to get a specific site, we can put that in, or if we want to get the collections which belong to a specific site, we can go to site uh, slash sites like we have already. We can add in the site ID like we just got for our no code demo site, and then we can do slash collections. So let's take a little bit of a look at that. So we do slash oops, slash the site ID. That is the one that I just copy and pasted right from here. So slash site ID slash collections. I'm going to hit send. Now, you can see I've got a 200, so that's worked. Before I scroll down and show you what I've got, let's just double check this one more time. So this is the site. These are the two uh, available collections. We've got blog posts and we've got offers. And if I scroll down, it's going to show me blog posts and offers because it's just went into the Webflow database and pulled out the information that I asked for. It's pulled every collection related to my site. Uh, similarly, if I went in right now, and if I added another collection and then went ahead and queried that, it would work, it would show up, it would let me see that information as well. Now, what I want to update this time is offers. So I'm going to grab this ID and before we kind of get into how we would maybe add an offer in, let's just take a quick look at that collection, what's in it, what are the field types, etc. So we come back. Uh, if we want to get a collection with full schema, so the schema is just the collection of fields, it's just another word for the, the model or the database fields or table, whatever you want to call it. If I go uh, to, I think that said collections this time, so slash collections slash my collection ID, which again, I've just taken from down here, um, begins 6051, 6051. If I look at that and I do a get request there, this should bring me back the details of this database table. So it's not only telling me, yep, it's the offers, we knew that, but it's also telling me the different fields. So we've got the bio field, the bio summary, uh, the picture, the email, the Twitter profile link, Facebook link, name, etc. And let's just sense check that in the UI. So if we go to offers and we look at the settings, this is going to tell us the different fields that we've got. And there you go, we've got name, we've got bio, bio summary, picture, email, Twitter profile link, etc. Everything that you can see on this interface in our database, you can also see here in the API, you know, and again, this is just key value pairs, JSON style, we've got name, name, type of field, plain text, is it required, true, which is a Boolean field or true false field. Um, so that just lets us see kind of what we need. Now, if I have a quick scroll down here, 
Uh, required is going to tell me when I create a new offer in this database, do I need to add this field or not? So do I need to give them a Facebook field, a Facebook profile link? Well, it's required, false, so no, I don't. But do I need to give the offer a name? Required is set to true, so yes, I do. If I try to create um, a request without giving them a name, then it's just gonna break, it's not gonna work for me. So let's go ahead and try that out. In fact, we'll do one other thing. We'll do one other thing, actually which is we will just have a look at items because remember items sit underneath a collection. All I need to do is if I want to look at the, the items under the offers collection, I've got the idea there, the ID number, sorry, not that idea, and uh, I'll type slash items, I'll hit send. That will give me a 200 because obviously that worked. And now I can see every single offer that's inside there. So who have we got? Lazaro Jast, we've got um, Maxi Clocko, we have got Bradley Hudson, etc. And if we just go back, sense check that against the actual offers on here. There you go. Lazaro Jast, uh, Max Aklico, Bradley Hudson, etc., etc. So that is all very good and well. Now there's a couple of things that I want to explain here. Um, do you remember in the last video we talked about uh, what we called a query string? And it's basically this idea that um, when you want to send some parameters to an API and you're doing a GET request, typically they go in the URL. Because here's the thing that you might not know, and this might be a little bit confusing, but whenever you go to any website ever, you are actually doing a GET request. Every browser operates by doing a GET request to a page. When I go to google.com, my browser is saying GET google.com. And so GET in that sense, the URL that you use is always you can consider it public information. It's not that anyone can see your computer, but for example, if you go to google.com uh, with a GET request, anything that you include in that request in terms of parameters is going to be saved to them, um, and potentially you know, a hacker could stand in the middle and grab that data. So we very rarely, um, we would, uh, and, and by the way, that's unlikely in this day and age, uh, things tend to be encrypted, but we would very rarely send um, you know, really valuable information in a URL with GET, we would tend to use POST for that because the way that GET works is you can put headers and authentication in, but you cannot put proper parameters in. You can't say the name should be this or the email should be that um, because what happens is if you look up here, you see this little uh, question mark and then I've got this method equals GET and URL equals this URL, so on and so forth. Well, essentially what happens here is uh, a query string just takes your parameters and puts them into the um, into the URL. You might have went on a website before and seen the little question mark come up and then it says something, or maybe if you sign up for a new account somewhere and you click a link that comes to your email to activate the account, you will notice these always have these, these question marks and then all this data in it. That's a query string. Um, and so, you know, you don't massively have to worry about it, but I'll show you why I pointed it out. So I've kind of put some headers, parameters in here. Now you'd assume, if I wanted to add parameters to my, you know, my get request, I would do that. And sometimes you can do things like, you could put in a parameter like limit to 100. So if I had more than 100 items in my, um, a, the list of blog offers, then it would come back with only, you know, however many I say. So if I've got 100, I could limit that to 10, you know, I could limit that to 20, etc. cetera, by putting this parameter in here. But if I want to do a post request, then things change a little bit. Let's have a look. So the interface has changed a little bit. I've still got parameters and stuff down here, but remember those are query string parameters. I can still keep this here, I can still keep authentication, but and, and every tool, by the way, is going to show this slightly differently, but I now have this thing called a request body, and the body is encrypted. It's the encrypted bit that we are going to send uh, to Webflow, to whoever else we're sending an API to, and it's where we put our key value pair parameters. So this is where things get really interesting. Now, if we go and take a look at how we add an item, so we want to add an item to a collection, what have we got to do? Well, we've got to tell in the URL, we've got to do a post first of all, but we've got to do collections, we've got to specify the collection ID, we've got to spe specify items, and that's fine and well. So uh, we've, we've essentially got that already. Instead of getting the information, this time we're posting to it. So instead of getting those items, we're now going to create a new item, and this is the only distinction you've kind of got to make. But the bit that does change is the details that we send. Now, you have this option in... Uh, 
in uh, hopscotch, you'll have it in most, which is called the raw input. So I kind of have this option here, right, where I can add a key. So I can say, here's my key, here's my value. I'll call it key one, two, three, and I'll call it, you know, value five, six, seven. So I can put that there and that as a parameter. Um, and that can work, but sometimes I'm going to want to manually enter JSON. Now, you wouldn't, it's really, really uncommon. Um, you don't often want to do it. Um, but sometimes you get an API like Webflow or that kind of thing, which is a little bit pernickety in the way it works. And one of the things that you might often have to do is send, you know how we talked about in JSON uh, in these terms of objects. So you've got data uh, that kind of sits under one other piece of data. In fact, I think I've still got that um, text pad open. So yeah, so you remember how we have this kind of idea here where we've got inventory items as part of our, our JSON data. Um, and then I've actually got this kind of object underneath it. Let me just split this out so I can show you visually. That's quite handy, I had that open. And, uh, you know, we kind of have this idea here where, uh, let me see if that'll tab, no it won't. Where you've kind of got this data, it sits under inventory items and it's kind of, it's contained within its own object. So if we remember previously, this was our order object. We know it's an object because it's contained in these two brackets. Then we've got our order number, so our key or value, or key or value. And then we had this, which was another object. Uh, let me just put that back up where I had it before as well. Just try to get it looking the way it was looking when you last seen it. Um, we had another object within our object, so it had these brackets to denote it. Well, not every API will do this, but Webflow just so happens to do that for the request. So I've got to specify the field. So if we look at this, I've got to specify the fields within an object, and that object is contained within the base object I'm sending. So whenever I send a JSON object, and hopefully when you do an API yourself, you won't have to mess around with this, because it is a bit of a pain, you know, it's something you'll just play around with. But whenever I do a JSON object, um, or sorry, whenever I do a post request, there is also always a JSON object um, within it. Whenever it says application slash JSON, which will be almost every API you use, then you will have this object. So there's a couple of things I could do. I could mess around uh, trying to get the, um, trying to get it all working and, and trying to write it out properly, but this is meant to be no code, not programming. And one of the exciting things about APIs is that you can essentially just copy and paste your way to, um, to making this work. Now, there's a couple of things actually. Let me paste that probably the way that you would do it. So I'm just gonna paste that. Now remember, this is curl. Uh, this is, curl is, as I, I mentioned in the last video, it's a little application you get on your own computer um, that can let you make API calls, but it is entirely done with typing. You do not want to use it, it is super confusing. I'm a programmer and I still struggle with it. So I'm just gonna take what they had in that box and I'm gonna paste it the way that you might as a, um, a, a no-code user. And there's a few things I need to clear up. Have a look at the difference between that and this. Do you see any dollar sign or anything before that? Do you see a quotation mark after that? You don't, so let's take it out. So delete that, delete that, delete that. Do you see data binary in there? Nope, you don't because that's some curl stuff. So take that out and suddenly here we have our, um, our, our JSON object. I'm just gonna take a bit of excuse me, space away there, I don't think it'll matter, but I can essentially, I've now pasted this in, I can change these fields to whatever I want, I can kind of say, right, um, this is obviously taking a blog post title rather than an offer, so not all of these fields will apply, but I can kind of just delete these and just put in whatever fields I want. So I'm only gonna have these two fields because they are required. So I'm gonna say, right, the blog's offer's name is Niall Freighter, we put that in, um, the only reason I deleted those fields is because they are kind of pure example fields. But what this does do is it means I've immediately got that kind of JSON structure, right? I've got kind of fields are there and that's inside another one. You know, those are the bits that I don't need to um, to mess around with. So what I can now do is uh, I can either, you know, I could check through here if this was a different API and there was various kind of different fields I wanted to paste in. Or I could double check here, I can see what settings I've got that I want to mess with. Well, the only two that are required are name and slug. So I want to go ahead and try that. So what we're just going to do is take out this comma, because if you remember, 
from here. The only time we use a comma is if we have another key value pair waiting. This is the last key value pair um, within this object, within these two curly brackets. Therefore, I want to take that comma out. And you'll notice um, Hopscotch brought up a little X. If you see that, that means something is wrong with your JSON. You've typed it wrong um, and it suggested I need to get rid of that. So let's just double check. We've got our URL. I'll just move my face out of the way. We've got our URL. Brilliant. What else do we need? Accept version and our token. Well, we've got accept version there. We've got our token there. And we also need um, content type application JSON. Now, quite often uh, a no-code tool will um, will put that in, a, or sorry, any API tool really will put that in here when you go to do a post because it is so common. Other times you can just put it in the header and right now it's take a set version or whatever other, uh, whatever other um, API headers you're using. But we're good to go, so let's send this and see what happens. Now I'm hoping we're gonna get a 200 response and uh, that is going to enter into our offers database. So we'll send that. We've got a 400, a validation error. Now there's two fields that we missed that were required. So let's take a little bit of look at how we can just debug this because almost certainly at some point you are going to, um, you're going to try an API, you're going to try and make something work and you're going to run into a problem and the problem is probably going to make very little sense to you. So let me talk through what happens here. So we get this response back, it's, uh, it gives us a message, gives us a code. So we get 400 and we get validation uh, failure. Now the first thing that we can do is jump back into our errors and let's have a quick look. So 400 means a syntax error. It means something in the request body was incorrectly formatted, likely invalid JSON being set up. Now that could be the case, but thankfully it tells us a little bit more about what went wrong we were missing two required fields. Now, how did we miss them? Well, the reason we missed them is because if we look here, they aren't actually included in this database. They're not included in this visual element, or they are, but not what you think. So this is just a list of themes, uh, or sorry, of fields. If I cancel out here, for every single post uh, that I've got here, I can choose to go into that, and I can save that as a draft, or, if I don't want to save it as a draft, I can select it, I can go like that, and I can archive it. So I've got these options to be drafted or archived, and therefore, those are two pieces of information that weren't just shown wherever I like on the UI, they were actually shown in a different place. And if we go back, this is missing two fields, underscore archived and underscore draft. Now, I deliberately never pointed it out at the time, but when we looked through our offers, um, a collection when we downloaded that as an API and we looked at all the fields archived and draft were fields that were there they were there we just chose um, to ignore them for the time so that we could get this error and see what happens now you get a bunch of other information quite often it's not going to be that useful if you really know what you're doing it could be but the bit you really want to pay attention to is this part that says problems so we've got two fields archived and draft those fields are required now if I have a quick look back at my reference, let's just double check what those fields were and, and what we need to do with them. So we're gonna to go to create new item, maybe it's under here. There we go, so archived is false, so that must be a Boolean field, and draft is false, so that must also be a Boolean field. Now we've got a couple of things we could do, we could just copy and paste that, to be honest. Or we could type it in ourselves. I'll just copy it, because we're no coders, we're not coders, we don't want to type it in manually and paste that in. Now I'm just going to make that line up nice and easy. Uh, you see the mistake I've made here? I've left that comma in because although I've added another two, now draft is the last comma, uh, or sorry, the last key value pair, so we don't need a comma. We've put a comma now under slug again, so we've got four fields now, name, slug, archive, draft. Um, if you put archived to true when you create this item, it would essentially um, immediately archive it. Um, if you set it to false, it won't. And similar with draft, if you put in as false, it should publish the full uh, post immediately. If you put it in as true, then it will come up as a draft. I think that's right. We'll double check in a wee second. Um, so everything's still set up, header, authentication, etc. Let's hit it again and see what happens. And this time we've got a 200. So previously that item didn't exist, but now it does. Now we've got this Nile Freighter offer blog post written out. We've got an ID, um, and let, 
look at this. So if I go in here and refresh, you need to refresh every time you update the database, um, just so that Webflow knows to pull it through. But what we've essentially done is just created an item in our uh, offers database or CMS. And so when I come in here, this is a good sign. Offers now says 11 rather than 10. And there we go, Nile Freighter right at the top. So I've just created that. I've just pushed that into um, my, uh, my database via API entirely through this tool here. We've just done that live and it has worked. Now, there's a couple other things that I could do just to bring that to life a bit more. Um, you know, for example, if I want to update the collection item, maybe I want to change some of the um, some of the different you know information in there, put some more in, then I'm able to do that as well. And it just kind of works really more or less the same way. Um, you know, I'm still putting in the same information. If you look in the right here, sorry, let me get my face out of the way again. Bad lockdown haircut out of the way. Um, if you have a look at all the information that we've got on the right, it looks exactly the same as creating because typically when you update, all you do is put the same information in again. Um, you'll have to make sure you've put required fields in, but other than that, you don't have to put every single field in. You only have to put in the ones that are required and the ones which you actually want to update. Um, so if I wanted to update the Twitter profile link, then I can do that. Um, if I don't want to update Facebook profile link, I can just leave that out. So um, we'll go ahead. We'll make some kind of change here. So let's go back to request body. Uh, now we're going to take, uh, let's just add a new field in. We'll update, we can update them all at the same time. Uh, what was that other one called? I believe it was called Twitter profile link. Now I may get the field name wrong. We'll soon find out. Oops. Um, so I'm just going to do that. And I'm going to do HBS, twitter.com slash Nile, which is my Twitter account. So, We've put a comma in there, now that we've got a new uh, key value profile. I think that is what that field is called. I don't really want to delete my whole API, so I can go back and double check. Twitter profile link, let's take a bit of a guess. I think I've got it right, but it might come back by an error, and we'll just have to see. So everything looks right, except we are no longer creating a new item. We are updating an existing item, so we're going to have to put a slash there. And just like the API ref says, it needs to be, um, oops, want to do update. Just like the API reference says, it needs to be collection slash collection ID slash item slash item ID. And you notice one other thing? In order to uh, change it, we are switching to a put. Because if you remember back, get is read, post is create, put is update, and delete is delete. So let's take that. Uh, let's put that up there. Let's uh, paste that there. I'm just going to copy and paste. That's just in case switching to put deletes anything. Sometimes API tools are just like that. Poor user experience. But not thankfully, Hopscotch has got a great user experience. Um, everything's kept the same. We've got a put request. Let's hit send it. See what happens. Boom, we've got 200. And it's come back. And look, it's confirmed a few things. So the ID still stays the same because we've only updated it. Um, it's now got a new field that tells me when I've last updated it, which is great because in the future, if I want to up, uh, check when was a post updated last, I can do that. I can also see who updated it. So imagine you had an organization with 100 different users and you built an app for them to use and underneath the hood, that app used um, APIs like this to transfer information. Well, because you can now see who updated it and when they updated it, you in person, by the way, would just be a unique identifier for me that'll be saved in some other database. Because you can see all that, you can now build audit trails, you can do um, you know, history, you can see a history of changes, etc. And this is all the information that people build up to use the features that you kind of know and love, like you know, who clicked it last, who's a collaborator, um, version control, all that stuff is purely from these types of fields. But you can see a new piece of information here, twitter.com slash Nile, let's re Fresh our UI again and again I've only got to refresh that just because Webflow needs that in order to, to kind of update the database with anything that's happened in the API. In reality though that information is already live on the web. But we go here, go to offers, go to Nile Freighter, let's look at his Twitter profile link and there you go, it's in, it's working and it's done. So that is how you do um, APIs. I just wanted to show you one quick example, which is just, I'm not going to set this up or anything, this will only take 30 seconds. I just want to show you how this might work in Zapier. Um, because, you know, 
this is us purely doing it manual. That's very really going to happen. When you've got an app running, you want it to be making API calls while you sleep. So you might do something Zapier. Let's say you've got um, a, you're, let's say you're building an app so that every time somebody tweets, it, you know, I don't know, it, it sends it to somebody um, via API. Well, what you could do is you could set up a random trigger. Now I'm not going to bother doing that, but you can see Zapier is going to let you do things like, uh, you know trigger when you get a new follower, when you get a like tweet, etc. But what we can do is we can add in an action. And I just want to show you how this looks. Again, we're not going to take the time to fill it out, but I can type in webhooks. Now, uh, webhooks are something we're going to do another video on, but Zapier uses them not only to mean an actual webhook, but also to do an API call. So we've got get, we've got post, we've got put. We don't have delete because it's so rare, um, but as Zapier says, you've got this idea of custom requests. You can buy it off a custom request, which is just essentially put in whatever you like, um, but much in the same way that we did a kind of raw body here, you can do that. So with Zapier, let's say I want to get a get request, um, hit continue. This is what the configuration looks like. So I would just put in something like, now, by the way, because this is Zapier, you can pull all sorts of data. Um, so you can pull the data that goes in these fields from whatever steps come before, but I would just do something like webflow.sites, uh, we'll get query string parameters, I do want to send it as JSON, well that's the equivalent of saying application slash JSON. Um, we've got headers, you know, we could do accept version 1.0.0.0, um, basic off, you know, we can just put our uh, pipeline in there or we can do our pipeline sorry our token uh, I think I read that there pipe uh, you can do bearer and then you can do you know the big long string whatever it was so that's just a really quick look um, this video is not about showing you how this works I just wanted to give you an idea of how how this interface relates to this interface here you know you've got your headers um, you can send it as JSON, you've got your query string parameters um, alternatively if I was to put a post in in fact I'll just show you a post um, if we do set that to post, it will change up a little bit. So again, we're going to have our uh, URL, but this time we've got our data. So we've got, you know, name would be Niall Freighter. Um, I can hit that. I can say, um, uh, well, here's an example. So that field we did profile link, you know, what I can actually do here is um, I can pull that data in from Twitter itself, for example. So you can play around with this, you can get to know it, but that is in a nutshell how APIs call, a API calls work. Um, we've kind of explored, you know, debugging, errors, copy and pasting, and I think the takeaways are, you know, it's going to take you a bit of experimentation to play around with it. Um, you're going to just start to understand how you read that kind of information. This is going to feel really, really technical, um, but it really is kind of as technical as it's going to get with no code. And to be honest, um, hopefully, hopefully you're kind of seeing the takeaway of you can broadly copy and paste your way around this. You know, once you understand the basics, it is fairly easy to just pull it all together, copy and paste a few bits, mess around with it until it works. You know, just pay attention, read the documents, and uh, and you'll get it working. The good news is with the average no-code app, you know, so many of these things are already integrated. Zapier, for example, everything we just did in Webflow, we can do on Zapier by pointing and clicking. Um, so it is a lot easier in practice to do these kind of things, but there's a good chance at some point you're going to be building an app, you're going to run into an API, it's not on Zapier, it's not integrated to a no-code tool, you've got to build integration yourself, and that is where this will come in handy. And the other place it will come in handy is when Zapier, Integromat, these type of tools are not doing what they should be doing or don't have the full functionality, at that point you'll be able to dive in, you'll be able to understand where things are going wrong, and I can guarantee you this knowledge from the last three videos alone is already putting you head and shoulders above your peers who are also trying to learn no code, but without the benefit of really understanding the fundamentals and almost where no code starts to overlap with tech. So apologies for the tech, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there and uh, you know go give your mind a rest. Thank you very much.